Welcome to Ear Biscuits. I'm Link. And I'm Rhett. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we have Lily Singh, known to her fans on YouTube as Superwoman. Superwoman is a comedic vlogger with millions of subscribers, subscribers, a unique background, an empowering voice, and a hilarious impersonation of her parents. <laughs> uh, we discussed with her her involvement in the religion of Sikhism, how YouTube made her lose her religion, and why she needs a security team when she meets fans in her parents' homeland of India. Also, we did something that maybe we shouldn't do, uh, at least we did it for the first time, and that is we gave her uh, our input, our advice on her love life. Well, so we'll see. And my advice see, is better. See how she takes that. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. But first, I I've been holding this story red. I didn't want to tell you what happened to me, my airport experience. Uh, mm-hmm. I wanted to share it with all of you out there and with Red at the same time. So, um, yeah, I just don't like I don't like for you to hear a story and then have to act like you're hearing it again. So this is. But I, I am I'm, very I'm, good at that. I'm I'm saving I've saved this one for all of you together. Um. Have you ever seen an angel? Uh, I've seen paintings. Have you ever? In, per- in real life? Yeah. Some people th- think they have, or maybe they have. Other people maybe have been angels. Have you ever been an angel? I don't know if that's this how is, it works. That, that's the intro to my story for you. I believe that in some way, I've been, I've been an angel. Isn't that a song? <laughs> uh, there's that country, country band Alabama has the song... I, I believe there are angels among us. Oh. And that is kind of what I'm thinking about. Oh, I believe there are angels among us. I was one of those angels to somebody. Okay, here's what happened. Okay, I'm, um, I'm, my interest is peaked. I flew to uh, Google headquarters for a panel to discuss what we do, but things are so busy that we decided that Rhett was going to stay back and work on some other stuff, kind of divide and conquer, so mm-hmm. to speak. Um, and I am just not in the habit of checking flight information ahead of time. I, I don't. I just assume everything's going to work out just fine, or that they'll text me or something. So I get to Burbank Airport to fly to San Francisco. Uh, I'm flying back the same night. It's just first time I've ever done that. I felt like a businessman hmm. getting on a plane for a meeting, then get right back on a plane and come back to and fro in the same day. Yeah, I I get to Burbank, and I get up to the. Uh, the ticket counter, and of course, nobody's there in Burbank. There's no lines. That's the beauty of flying out of Burbank. And I uh, get up there. I was like, okay, 1030 flight to San Francisco. Um, sir, it's been canceled. Okay. Canceled. Problem. Not not delayed. Ain't even happening. Did they say you're going to have to fly there with your angel's wings? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I said, well... I mean, I gotta, I've got to basically be there in a couple hours, and then I'm flying back. There's no way this can happen. What can you do? They said, well, there is, there's no other flight out of here. Can you get to LAX, which is, at that time of day, at least an hour drive to drive all the way across LA to get to LAX. Huge airport. Then you got all those problems. Like, well, yeah, I mean, if you could do that. So she booked me on a flight out of LAX, and I'm going to get back in the car and just drive there. I said, well, you got to change my return flight because I'm flying back to, tonight. And I'm going to get back in my car and drive back. So she said, I don't think I can do that. But then she was able to work her magic and do both of those things. Potential angel candidate right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, about the time that I'm wrapping up, an old lady kind of walks up, almost hobbles up, I'm just going to be honest, to the kiosk next to me. Um, she says, 1030 flight to San Francisco. Ooh. I'm sorry. That flight's been canceled. Immediate physical bodily reaction from this woman. I thought she was going to start crying. Oh, no, I I have to meet my daughter. She said, well, there's a 3.30 flight. I, I cannot wait that late. She wasn't being clear, a jerk, but she was d- distraught. Mm. But she, she was legitimately upset. What was the engagement? Well, I don't know. She's talking to the woman at the kiosk. And the woman at the kiosk said, well, that's the best we can do. I mean, I can book you out of LAX. She's like, well, I, how would I get to LAX? And I look at her. I said, this angel right here. You can ride with me. <laughs> and I just, and it's just one of those moments where I didn't even really think. I was just like, wow, we're in the same situation. She needs to go to the same mm-hmm, place. Right? She's upset. Um, 
she's an old lady. And you know the you know the saying, help an old lady across the street. Well, what about help an old lady across Los Angeles? It's even better. And it takes so she, more work. So I said, I can take you. And she turns and looks at me, looks me up and down, thinks for a second, and she says, Well, I'll take that risk. That's what well, she said. Yeah, yeah. She said, Well, I'll take that risk. And I was like, Okay, you just did it. You looked at me and just did a risk assessment. And she kind of laughed. And the the two girls behind the kiosks started laughing. And she said, um, You you look like a fine young man. That, okay. That's a good and I was start. like, I was like, Well, I got to go to the bathroom. I'll meet you right back here in a few minutes and then we can get in my car. Oh, you really have to go. We can huh? drive. <laughs> so, so then I, I had went, to lighten the load before oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> added an extra passenger. So I went to the restroom and then I came back and I just had this feeling of like, I don't know, maybe I, like I was, di- oh, I'm di- all of a sudden I'm in the middle of doing a good deed. Are you, this you, is, a, this makes me feel amazing. Do you do good deeds so seldomly that, that I, I th- guess this, so. this gave you a feeling of exhilaration? And then we're walking out. I took an like, old lady to the airport no, twice last didn't. week. You did not. I'm like taking her luggage for her. Like we're, go- we're having go up the parking deck and she gets in the car and she's talking to her daughter on the phone. And she's like, well, this, this, this fine young man, nice young man has decided he's going to take me across Los Angeles. And I'm still going to be there. I don't know what time, but I think I'm going to make it. And... Uh, at that point, we're already driving. She's on the phone with her daughter, and I'm thinking, uh, "Yeah, you should you should tell her that I I'm also going to chop you up and and eat you for dinner." Like that's the that's the joke that went through my mind. You kept that to yourself. A though. cannibalistic uh, serial killer joke. You, you you should have kept that to yourself right now on Ear Biscuits. <laughs> I mean, I don't just... know why I thought that would. I guess because I was surprised that. She would just ride with a total stranger out of lo- uh, across Los Angeles. You're just a man who needs to get to San Francisco. I mean, how bad can you be? Well, I could be a serial killer. I mean, serial killers don't take flights like that. You know, I I, I just don't I don't believe that serial killer. But would an angel think the you know, joke that I thought? Serial killers plan out things over months. Mm. They don't just like say, "I'm going to go to the airport. Maybe my flight will can't get canceled, and I'll take somebody to the no." They, this right. is totally circumstantial. There, she has no reason to be suspicious other than the way you look. Well, I, I appreciate everything except the last thing you said because I, I am torn between thinking I'm a potential serial killer or like, a, like an angel in disguise. <laughs> So uh, you know, we had a we had a lovely uh, hour long conversation. What was she getting to though? I, what, what was what was so? Uh, she was visiting her daughter. Uh, her husband had recently passed away, so she wanted to spend some time with her daughter, like R and R. I don't know why she was in such a hurry to get there. Honestly, oh, wow, it would have been better if but she had said she had to get to like a wedding. No, she didn't. I'm or the, sorry. Or the birth I of a child. I have to be have to be honest. <laughs> but we had a lovely hour long conversation, and um, it's just funny because I. You know, when, when we get there, she's like, I want to, I want to pay for valet. And, and I was like, I don't think there's valet parking at LAX. And it turns out there wasn't, but she still gave me a $50 bill. Wow. And, um, uh, I was glad at that point that I didn't say the, the serial killer joke out loud. Cause I got the $50, helped her, helped her check her bag and get in there. We were on the same flight and she made it. And, and then, uh, you know, I got home, told my wife. And I got some brownie points, if you know what I mean, from the wife for uh, being, you know. So I'm not telling you people in order to get any sort of, wow. Um, <laughs> wow. I'm just seeing how your any world sort works. Of credit. I feel like I, I feel like I know you well. <laughs> um, but okay, I see how it works. See how it works in your. What do you own, mean? When you when you do a good deed, you surprise yourself. You have thoughts of what it would be like if I was a serial killer in this instant. Yeah. Instance, and then your wife. Uh, gives you favors when you do good <laughs> deeds. I mean, this is... I need to be rewarded for this being is, such uh, a... Wow. You need to be better self-motivated, I think, is, a, is the answer here. It felt good to be an angel. I think I'd like to do it one day. Okay. Full-time, re- full-time angel. Just call John Travolta. I recommend that. Okay. Well, you did something good. 
And, uh, you know, I think it's appropriate that you did one good thing this week because uh, our guest this week on Ear Biscuits is uh, very much about doing good. That's kind of her That's, that's kind of her message. Uh, Lily Superwoman Sing, she's garnered over 2 million subs and 176 million views in the past three years thanks to her comedic vlogs. A couple of examples, How Girls Get Ready has uh, 4.5 million views and Types of Kids at School has 4.4 uh, 4 million. So, uh Here's our conversation with uh, the angelic, question mark? Hmm. No, this is the super. The superwoman. Superwoman. Yeah, just keep, you know, whenever you move, just keep the mic gotcha. wherever you are. Uh, gotcha, gotcha. Just keep it right there. Yes, sir. If you can't hear yourself, we can't hear you. <laughs> it's kind of like looking in a camera if you can't yeah, see the if you camera can't see the camera the camera can't see you i have to tell that to adults all the time in group pictures you think an adult would know that now i don't think adults know how to take pictures or am i just referring to indians right now <laughs> <laughs> maybe just indians <laughs> well tell us more about that uh, indians can't take pictures it's as simple as that my mom tries taking pictures of me with my cell phone True story, once we went to India, I went to every historical place my mom took a picture of me at every place and i came home with an empty memory card 100% true story what happened? Because in Indian parents do not understand the concept of you have to push the button down a little bit and then push it down all the way. So it's just, she pushed it down a little bit each time and no picture got taken. She focused a yeah, whole lot. she focused a whole lot and no memories were captured. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Oh, That's wow. kind of sad because, I mean, was that a big trip? Uh, yeah, it's the last time I went to India, so it was like nine years ago. And that scarred me and I've never gone back, except I'm going back next month to take all the pictures again. <laughs> Right, you're going to go all uh, recreate yep. all those scenes. Yeah, I'm going to eat the because... food, going to get the diarrhea, going to relive all the memories. <laughs> oh, you had diarrhea? Everyone gets diarrhea in India. <coughs> and you, it's a and, rule. And you were asking your mom to uh, take photos of this. That's the only thing I wanted photos of. Focus, mom. Don't just focus. <laughs> exactly. Focus. I'm so focused right now. But it's it's interesting because when you take pictures, it kind of helps to solidify memories. So in the absence of those pictures, do you feel like... You're starting to question whether it even happened? 100%. Or does it get fuzzy? If I don't take a picture of my cheesecake, I feel like I've never eaten the cheesecake on Instagram. That's my issue. Like, it validates that I ate that cheesecake. And if I don't have a picture of that cheesecake, I never ate it. Well, see, and I feel that this is a symptom of of culture. Seriously, mm -hmm. we're dependent upon pictures to supplement our memory. And that's why I only take family pictures with Snapchat. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, I just, I take pictures of myself with Snapchat, of course. Yeah, that's but, not what Snapchat's for. <laughs> it, you know, in, in all family pictures, in all promotional pictures, it's all Snapchat, and it just lives for a little bit, and because I want my memory to hold it. I don't want my my MacBook to hold it. Or that's my interesting. Instagram feed. I'm not like that at all. My Instagram holds everything. Well, what happens when the grid goes down, Lily? Then I stop living life. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> I don't even know how I existed before Instagram, to be honest. The only reason I do things these days is because of Instagram. And it's sad, but it's true. The other day I got courtside seats to a basketball game. I know nothing about basketball. Nothing about basketball. My first thought was like, holy crap, this is going to be an awesome Instagram picture. <laughs> like that was my first and probably only thought throughout the game. What did you snap? I took a picture of one time um, the basketball hit my leg. I took a picture of that. I took a picture of my tickets. I took a picture of... Kobe. When the ball hit your leg, yeah. you were actually poised to take it, a because, photo? No, you know what it was? It it was um, rolling slowly, and so I kind of took my camera, and I was prepped for when that ball hit my leg. This is an NBA basketball yes, game? Yes, yes. So, and this was when like Kobe Bryant was having a conversation with us, and I was like, can you just stop speaking so I can take a picture right now? Of my leg <laughs> exactly. and a ball. Exactly. Exactly. Stop being rude, Kobe. God. Oh, yeah. wow. She's trying. I, I went to an NBA basketball game, but I was in the upper deck. How did you get courtside seats? This is. Um, uh, this was a meeting. I actually also came late and got there at halftime. Uh, so that seat was empty. Oh. True story, actually in Drake's seats. So that's how ungrateful I am. But um, it was a business meeting for a movie that someone wanted to be, me to be in. And they're like, hey, let's have a meeting. I'll come to the basketball game. So I was like, okay, cool. Let's have a meeting courtside. And then I came in. It was courtside. And I was like, oh, crap. I came late. And I'm one of those douchebags that came late. Oh, well, Taking know. a picture of my knee. Oh, yeah. it was a power play. It was a power yeah. play. I'll <laughs> show up at halftime. Exactly. So how long have you been on YouTube? I, my first video was three years ago. It absolutely sucked. <clears throat> it was mostly because I bought a new blazer and I wanted to show it off. So I made a YouTube video. Um, but I've a been jacket. Blazer. Is that, it was, it was or a, like a car? Like, like, a Chevy blazer? 
Oh God, no! It was <laughs> legitimately just a blazer from R W and Co. Which I don't know if you have that store here. I don't think we do. It's a fancy store. It was a fancy. It was seventy dollars. I was like, "Frig, I'm showing this off." So that's why I Sequined? made the video. No, it was just gray, but it was like sophisticated. Okay. It was a fitted, sophisticated blazer. So that's why I made the video. But it was a vlog about the blazer. <laughs> no, it was a spoken word piece about religion. It's what? so like nothing I've ever done before. It was a spoke. I was literally standing there with a piece of paper talking about something, and that was my video. So you just your motivation to make the video was I look good in this blazer, no, but, I've, well, but I've got to talk about something. Yes worth and about. no. Yes and no. My motivation to make it a video was the blazer. The message, though, I was like, should I do an audio? Should I make a, a record a spoken word? Just like you know what? So the video factor was decided by the blazer, but the actual message was because I was a little bit of a different person when starting YouTube. I was very religious and I was very about that and. To be honest, I feel like YouTube's kind of changed that for me a little bit, and I'm not that person anymore. So, which is why that video is not up anymore. I was about to say, I, you know, we just went and uh, tried to find that first right. video, right. or not try to find that one. Just saw what your first video was, right. and it was not that one. It was not. So that you one. took it yeah. down. Yeah, I did take it down. Now, what, what's what's the religion? So the religion is Sikhism. Okay. Which you could say Sikhism, depending on where you're from. But uh, well, if you say Sikhism, I then say that's Sikhism. What, that's what we're going to say. Right, because usually when I say um, I have to say the ism part. When I say sick, I get a lot of concerned fan emails <laughs> that are like, wait, what's wrong with you? Always I'm a sick. sick. Yeah, 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 you're sick. So, you know, that okay. whole thing happens. But it's Sikhism, Sikhism, which is a religion from northern part of India, mostly, Punjab. Uh huh. I'm trying to say facts. I really don't know anything, though. <laughs> But yeah. So and this is a and this is a minority religion in in India, right? Yeah, it's in a fairly m- new religion as well, worldwide. Newer religion. As in how new? As in you're asking me facts. I don't know. I'm gonna say a couple hundred years. Okay. Yeah. So pretty young religion. And yeah. what what are the basic? The tenets? basics of this religion are so one God. Doesn't matter what religion you follow, whether you follow goddesses, gods. They believe in just one overall being that's imageless. Um, and they don't believe in rituals. They believe in, they don't believe in rituals, but they believe in certain things to follow. So it's a little bit confusing. I don't know everything about it, but so characteristic traits would be wearing a turban, not cutting your hair, mm-hmm. um, stuff like that. Pretty much. So, I don't know so too being much, a, but, a monotheistic religion in India, mm-hmm. where there's Hinduism, which is obviously not that right. Very polytheistic. So how how is um, how's it different when people well, when people meet you and they okay she's from an indian background mm-hmm, mm-hmm. do they just assume things about your religious 100%, affiliation 100 percent. they assume i'm a vegetarian but i am which is kind of not helping my case um vegetarian my parents are super strict i'm not allowed to drink have fun party do my eyebrows shave my legs um things like that i get a lot of that and that's obviously not true about well, you. Well, it is. It depends how religious you are and what you... The thing about religion, why I discovered that religion is just not for me, it's because everyone interprets it their own way. And having said that, everyone interprets it their own way, but then also judges people in their own way. So really, I feel like religion is just whatever you want it to be. And people forget that sometimes. I'm very curious that you said that as you became a YouTuber and developed this career that you have now, mm-hmm. that that seemed to be the driving force and kind of moving away from, I guess, what was your religious upbringing. Right, right. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to put a pin in that. I'd like to come back to that. But mm-hmm. let's, l- let's go back to um, the beginning of, right. your, uh, of your story here. So, not, even, not even YouTube. I'm mm-hmm. talking about where were you born, where were you raised, right. what, what was that like? So I was born and raised in Scarborough, which is a pretty ghetto little suburb in India. No. <laughs> Scarborough in Ontario <laughs> in Canada um, so I was born and raised there I went to a ghetto school which explains a lot of my ghetto-ness in my videos and I like, love to embrace that so when people define think, ghetto so school. ghetto is like <clears throat> my neighborhood had a lot of like when the ice cream tr- truck came around it was like the excitement of the weekend. And if he wasn't jumped and robbed, it was even better. <laughs> so you're um, saying it was like a poor neighborhood or it, not was, even, it was just a there dangerous was, there was neighborhood? Kind that... of. Like my school, the area my school was in had a lot of crime, a lot of violence. It was like we were never allowed to do anything in school, never allowed to hold events, never allowed to have school trips because it was considered this dangerous area with a lot of crime and gangs. Um, and just it was that area that was always on the news. It was kind of that, you know the media made it into that area that was like, don't go there, you're going to get jumped or shot or something. So, so did your parents move from India to yeah, so Toronto? 
I have that typical story of arranged marriage. So my parents had an arranged marriage. My dad came to Canada first, sponsored my mom over, and then they had my sister and I. And what what, uh, brought your parents over? The same thing that brings every Indian to Canada, which is like, oh, the dream, man, the dream of getting a job and just better opportunities and stuff like that. So what line of work uh, was he in or so is he in? So my dad, when he first came to India, had like three jobs. He was a furniture salesman. You said salesman. came to India? Sorry, came to Canada. He was okay. a furniture salesman. He was a security guard. My mom worked at a factory. Currently, my parents run a line of gas stations. So they have a chain of gas stations that they manage. Okay, yeah. and so their marriage was arranged, yep. and were they in the Sikh, Sikh uh, religion as well? So mm-hmm. that's why you were brought up that when, way? Oh, yeah. When you are in an arranged marriage, you have no options like that. It's like you have to be the same religion from the same village and went to the same school and be on the from the same side of this river. It's very particular of who you have to marry. So, so at what age? Did, did they, they get married? Ooh, I think my mom was young. She was probably like, I don't, this is a valid question, probably like 20. Okay. okay, which is pretty old for some, yeah, some yeah, people not get married to like sixteen. So, so what was that like? Five Girl- years younger than you. Yeah. What was that? Girl- At this age, my mom had two kids. So, what was it like growing up in a in a household where you know your parents are an arranged marriage? Uh huh. Yeah. There's a lot of um, built up. Uh, you know, when I was your age, I never got to do that. Never got to date. I never had any choices. And so it's like because I struggled and went through this. Your life also has to be hell because of that. So. To be honest, though, my parents are super cool. Like, my mom's, I think, kind of given up on me in a way as well. So I don't think that's ever going to happen to me. They'll never force me to get an arranged marriage. And my parents, to be honest, when I was growing up, back to the whole religious thing, I was way more religious than my parents. My parents were never really super religious to begin with. How how did that happen? I don't know. I feel like it's just something I connected with growing up. Um, I went to the temple way more than my parents. Um, They never really taught me anything about Sikhism, to be honest. Everything I learned on my own, and it's just something I really connected with for a certain amount of time. And is, what's the age difference with your sister? Six years. She's older or younger? Older, she's older. She's that normal sibling that's married and has kids and is very normal. So she wasn't really into... Not uh, at all. No, no one from my family, with the exception of my grandfather, but he was even in India when I was growing up. So I really have no idea how I went down that path. No idea. And then, so how devout were you? Are there, what are some clear... Like, there was a some... period of time when I used to go to the temple every day. I just hmm. loved it. I used to go every day. I used to be re- listening to religious uh, like uh, hymns every day. and I just, I don't know. It was like for a year, two, three. The first time I became vegetarian in my life was religious reasons. Now I'm a vegetarian. It has nothing to do with religion. So, so the, the Sikh religion... Vegetarianism it, again, is part of it. it's interpretation. Some people will say, it doesn't say anywhere in there you have to be vegetarian. Some people are like, no, of course, page 54 of this, 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 it says vegetarian. So it's really, if you're a baptized sick, then I believe you do have to be vegetarian. Again, I could be totally making that up, so don't bombard my Facebook with religious text right now. So just like um, Christianity, there is a baptism? Yes, yes, yes. So but I imagine the, it's a different baptism. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same kind of process, same kind of rebirth has the holy water, you're getting kind of reborn into this new light. Same kind of concept. So what was it like, you know, obviously your your parents come from one culture and then they come to the West mm-hmm. and things are very different for them. Right. But they're basically who they're going going to be. Mm-hmm. You're you're born here, so you're you're born in the West, but you kind of gravitate towards this this religion, mm-hmm. which represents your culture. Right. Uh, but at the same time, you're going to this ghetto school, you right, say. Right. So what was happening? A how were those things of, a balancing A lot of out? the confusion was happening. In my school, I was a really big minority as well. Um, in terms of culture, I was one of the, like 10 Punjabi people in my school. Um, so I did have a lot of issues sometimes with racism, which is weird because the other kids were also brown, but just a different type of brown. Um, and I think that might have been one of the reasons why I started to identify with my religion and culture is because I didn't see it at my school. So I was like, I want to learn more about it and identify and figure out who I am. And that's probably one of the factors that led me towards it. But yeah, so there's a lot of confusion. Were you shunning some of those Western things that maybe now Not you're embracing at more? Not at all. Not at all. To be honest, I was still very open-minded about pretty much everything. The thing about growing up in my family is, like I said, it wasn't religious, but it's still very cultural, two very different things. Religion and culture clash severely. There's things in the Indian culture that are very, very super sexist (laughs) and super elitist and super everything that are nowhere in religion. So it's really, that's one of the reasons why I've gravitated away from religion, because culture and religion clash too much. And I believe it's all hypocritical. Mm. That's what I believe, so. But I thought you were saying that it was the the cultural 
uh, things that were added on to the religion that created the sexism, but you're saying that it's more the religious beliefs. I'm saying I'm saying inevitably people over time connect culture and religion when they shouldn't be connected. So you'll have people who follow a holy script that's all about equality and all about this, but those same religious people will be like, but my daughter can't do this and my son can. So those two become intertwined. That's the biggest problem I feel with religion. Okay, so if you were the devout one, I mean, your parents were saying things like, you've got it so much better than I do, Mm -hmm. but you were saying, "What? but I'm denying myself certain things Mm -hmm. or... I'm going. I'm more religious than you. Right. So, were you imposing more uh, rule keeping on yourself, so your parents didn't have to do that, or what was the relationship there? It was really just kind of a non-existent one, to be honest. It wasn't even like I imposed my religious beliefs on my family, or they did to me. They were kind of like, "Oh, she's going to the temple. Great, she's out of the house. Goddamn, that's beautiful for us." It wasn't even like I connected the two in any way. My parents obviously weren't opposed to me going to the temple. They didn't really care. It was just a little bit indifferent to them. I always had that choice. It was never like, Lily, you have to follow these beliefs and you have to do this. Even right now, as a non-religious person, my parents will never be like, you need to say you're sick and you need to follow this. You need to go to the temple. Never. They'll never do that. But were they having issues with some of the other cultural things that you were experiencing? Oh, 100%. Culturally, my parents hate me. <laughs> okay, so t- tell us, you know, t- what kind of yeah, things thing were you is, doing that they started cool having a problem with? When I started doing YouTube videos and even growing up, I used to dance. I used to be a professional Bhangra dancer and hip, like a hip-hop dancer. Um... I make YouTube videos right now and I'm putting myself on the internet culturally coming from an Indian background. My parents hated that. Mm. When I first started dancing, I was literally told like, you cannot dance because you're a woman and it looks really bad and people will judge you for that. You can't make YouTube videos because like, who, which family is going to want to marry like this woman who makes these YouTube videos? And so there's so many things like that. Even well, as right a now, child, how, how did they, when you started showing interest and started doing these things that mm-hmm. they may have disapproved of, how right. did they enforce that? What, or how did they try to enforce it? When I started dancing, my mom literally said no. She tried to make it so I couldn't. She's like, you are not allowed to go do it. And it was literally me going, I'm going to do it. And just a huge fight and just getting her to understand eventually. But even now, sometimes there's things where if I was to bring home someone that I wanted to marry one day, that wasn't the same religion and culture. That would be an issue. That would be a battle in itself. So hmm. there's things like that. There's a whole bunch of, my parents are super cool. My mom knows all the lyrics to Drake, but at the end of the day, she's still an Indian mother and she has lots of cultural, cultural things she believes in that I'm just like, mom, no. Maybe she yeah. should do it like a lip sync video or something. She that probably might could. go viral. She probably, she knows every lyric to Drake. <laughs> she knows every lyric to every, every song on the radio. She's so cool. She's if, super, super If cool. you don't put it on your channel, we'll put it on ours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, let's, let's give her her own channel. And let's that's do a this. Bit frustrating because like, <coughs> she's so cool in so many ways, so lenient. Now she loves YouTube things. She's just so cool. But then there's certain things that are embedded into them that they cannot change. Now, you mentioned your mom. Yeah. Uh, how was your dad responding to these things? Oh, my! I can literally say my dad is my number one fan legitimately number one fan. He knows how many subscribers I have at any given moment. If you ask him, he'll know the exact number of subscribers I have. He knows how many views any of my videos have. He knows which collaborations. That Cute story. He knows what I tweet. He doesn't even have Twitter. He doesn't even know what Twitter is. You know how he figures it out? He goes to my video, goes to the description, clicks the link to Twitter, and then reads my tweets because he doesn't understand that you can just go twitter.com. So he goes through <laughs> that whole process to check right. my tweets. Yeah. <laughs> Now, it's funny because when you're talking about your dad and your mom, I've I've realized that I am picturing you My characters. <laughs> playing your dad and yeah, your mom. Definitely, definitely. Because you do a lot of that. Right. I mean, one of the first things that Ren and I both said when we were watching your videos uh, in prep was uh, happy slip. Just, mm-hmm. for, you know, how you reminded us of her, just the way that she would play characters. Right. And I guess, you know, She's not a white girl. Maybe it's just kind of a subverted <laughs> racism thing that yeah, we're I think you're thinking. Totally racist, yeah. Um, but how she would play <clears throat> all of those is she an influence? Um, I feel like in terms of the characters, one of the biggest influences would be uh, Jenna Marbles. Sure. I feel like she does a lot of characters. Also, growing up in the YouTube community, but she's white though. That she is white. <laughs> You sometimes, can't be influenced by sometimes her. Sometimes <laughs> I feel like I don't always judge people by the color of their skin. Just sometimes. Um, <laughs> and growing up, there was also these two YouTubers in Toronto who are males and they're Indian. Um, and they're big influences for me as well. Who's that? Uh, so they're Just Rain and AK. Um, they're... I don't, you've probably never heard of them, maybe, unfortunately. They're just... They're well-known in the Toronto community and probably okay. in, in the rest of Canada and 
India, obviously, but they influenced me a lot because they did a lot of the characters and a lot of the, which is, I will always admit because people always pin me against them. And if they're listening to this, anyone listening to this will probably be like, oh, right now, the teeny boppers, because in Toronto, we are kind of those three brown YouTube kids and everyone pins us against each other. So when I say like, yeah, I got inspired by them, it's usually a huge, huge deal. That oh, because people, people compare you and they <laughs> yeah. try to. And yeah. I just don't care for that. So yeah, 100%, I've gained a lot of inspiration from them. Yeah, and I think, you know, like Link said, we're picturing you pay- playing the characters uh, of your parents. Mm-hmm. And that's something that, you know, you're pulling on that cultural heritage and, and your the, the way that your parents' perspective and you're finding comedy in that mm-hmm. that people are really connecting with. Like, how did you make that choice that, okay, I'm going to... You know, I'm I'm not going to be ashamed of my background. I'm going to kind of leverage my background and my culture, cultural heritage to kind of, you know, create my content. I feel like there's two things that go into that. <clears throat> One is I want to show people how no matter that my parents are Indian or whatever, they're probably exactly like your parents. And that's an underlying message in all my videos and why I started showing my parents even more or the, those cultural kind of stereotypes even more because I love in the comments when people are like, my parents are this, they're Asian, they're black, they're white, they're but they're just as crazy as that. Mm-hmm. And so the first time I showed those kind of cultural stereotypes was because I didn't know anything else. That's what I wanted to show because that's what happens at home. And then when I started to see that everyone connects with that, I'm like, this is no longer me showing my Indian parents. It's me showing my parents that everyone else connects to. Right. That was kind of like a very deep spiritual thing I went through. One of the very one of the many lessons YouTube has taught me is just that everyone is different and everyone is the same. So yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> when you started making your YouTube videos, l- let's go there. So it went from dance mm-hmm. to, and you won that battle. Mm-hmm. At what point did the YouTube videos come into the equation? So I danced all through my uh, the end of high school and all through my university life. I never did YouTube in school while I was still in university, which I feel is a blessing because I feel like I would have totally just dropped out. Um, so I got my degree, and it was in between deciding whether I wanted to do my master's or get a 9 to 5 that I decided to make YouTube videos. So it was literally like, dad. And what was your undergrad degree in? It was psychology. So I was debating doing my master's in counseling psychology. And I remember doing the applications and I was like, I friggin' hate this. I don't want to do this at all. So I literally went into my parents' room and I was like, listen, I don't want to do my master's. I want to make YouTube videos. And my after the ambulance came and left and all that jazz from my parents' heart attack, um, I'll never forget my dad was like, listen, if you want to make YouTube videos, just do it the best. Do it better than everyone else. Do it to the best of your ability and just rock it. And I'm, since then, I've been attempting to rock it because I'm like, damn, my parents are only going to be cool with this for so long. I need to become a superstar or this is not going to work. No, that's interesting. It's an interesting way to see it. Uh, you know, especially thinking about like our story of the way that we got into YouTube at a time where it was, no one was thinking about it. No one knew that it could be a career. It was mm-hmm. just like a place to put videos right. and then everybody kind of started realizing it. Mm-hmm. But you came to kind of a crossroads in terms of your career. Right. And one of your options was YouTube. So mm-hmm. how did you, what had happened before that to give you that perspective that YouTube could be a career? At uh, that point in time, I had a few videos out. And I mean, like they were hitting like one of my videos, like maybe 40,000 views around that kind of range. And at that point, I had done my research like I was a big fan of Jenna at that time was a big fan of Ryan big fan of Epic Meal Time and after doing that research I didn't think that oh YouTube's gonna be my career even right now I don't think YouTube is gonna be my career I wanted entertainment to be my career but Mm -hmm. I thought YouTube would be a platform for that so at that point in time I had done my research and I, I think I even had met up with Harley Harley was one of my big inspirations in the sense that I was a little small YouTuber and I made a video once that kind of mentioned Epic Meal Time, and he followed me on Twitter, and I remember fangirling so hard. He came to Toronto, and I DM'd him saying, hey, do you want to, like, just meet up? And I had the most inspirational, memorable conversation with that guy. He's so friggin' intelligent and smart. Did you have a date with Harley? Not a... mm, I wish I could say it was a date, but my manager and my other friend were there cock-blocking the whole situation. (laughs) No, it was literally just, I was like, I really would love to meet you, and just like talk YouTube because I don't know much about it so he was so kind he literally met up with me in just the lobby of his hotel we had a drink and just the best conversation ever um and from that I remember being like holy crap I'm inspired and this is totally possible he was talking about his merch talking about all these conferences conventions but he does this full time just the whole business aspect of it that I've never seen before I was like you're more than a beard and bacon I don't get it did he use the cheese analogy no 
Okay. He did that on it when he was here at really? this table. It was it was inspirational. Was you can it? go back and listen to it. I better. feel like everyone should have a conversation with Harley. I think he's one of the most inspirational people I've ever met. Maybe he could be a counselor, which seems yeah. ironic. A Jewish on, camp on, counselor. On, on, on several <laughs> which he levels. mentioned his camp experience. Okay, so you had, so what was uh when you made that decision to just put YouTube videos up before mm-hmm. that before that decision to go for it, mm-hmm. you know, leading up to the 40,000 views here, right. 40,000 views there. What was the what was the initial motivation? I know you said, okay, I've got this this uh, new suit, new, new blazer, <laughs> I'm going to make a video. Were you a part of the, like an observer of the YouTube community at the time? Not really. Not really at all. I think I came, became more of an observer of the YouTube community when I got involved in the YouTube community. And even right now, there's a lot of YouTubers that I should know that I know nothing about um it was more so ever since a young age i just loved entertainment i used to dance as i mentioned i loved i think i even used to make little silly videos with my cousins when i was growing up and i could just never imagine myself having a nine-to-five job even today like i could never ever imagine having a nine-to-five job working for someone else doing anything that's not just absolutely weird silly and fun i could never do it so Mm. it just kind of fell into place i was like there's this thing youtube and when i was growing up in high school there was no youtube we had right. no idea what YouTube was, and it was like a self-discovery where I saw a video, and I was like, oh, my God, what is this thing? And slowly I was like, YouTube, I want to do this, and just got into it. So you were studying Jenna and Harley and mm-hmm. other people, mm-hmm. and then what was your application um, to, to really start making it a career, to kind of go for it? I can honestly say if my first couple of videos hadn't been received so well, I might have never made another one. I was blessed in the sense that I really hit a niche market where this brown girl came on YouTube that was outspoken and everyone was like, what? And so I feel because of that it was received so well because there's no other, well, I hope I'm not making this up. I can't think of another Indian female YouTuber does what I do. So I really hit that market where people started sharing it and they're like, this is like nothing I've seen before. Um, and that happened when I started making my first comedy videos. It was after I took that first video down and I tried comedy, it was received super, super well. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, inter- you mentioned an interesting thing there that one of the things that sets you apart that you're a brown girl mm-hmm. who is stepping up and speaking in this way. That I like maybe that you weren't scared to say brown girl. I culture- appreciate that. <laughs> culturally, there may be this whole cultural heritage there that is saying you shouldn't be mm-hmm. talking like this yep. you shouldn't be portraying women in this way or whatever they might say so do you kind of feel like a a rebel uh i would love to feel like that i do feel like that i think being the whole brown girl has its pros and cons one huge con is that no matter what i do i will be hey that brown youtuber who will always be classified as that brown youtuber and always right. be clumped with the other brown youtubers and that's what she does that's like the defining trait it's a big pro because i'm gonna be completely honest if i wasn't that brown girl and i was just that girl there's many those girls on youtube so i don't think i would have gained that traction in the beginning that i did if i wasn't that brown girl so you i mean did you observe that the audience was kind of insulated and it's and it started in that community? 100%. I see even the majority of right now of my fan base is still brown. And that's inevitable. And I feel like that's okay because um, I feel like that's, like I said, inevitable. And I'm not one of those people that's like, no, I don't, wanna, I don't want my fan base to be. I talk to a lot of people and they're like, I don't want my fan base to be just this. I don't, but if it's a majority of brown people, that doesn't bother me at all. I understand why that would be. So do, do you I- see a big uh, representation in India? Do you, I mean, do- Fun fact. My top five countries, one of them is India, but across the world, my demographic is females age 13 to 25. The only country where that's not true is India, in which it's older men watch my videos. Really? Yes. Factual. Factual (laughs) proof. (laughs) What do you think is going on there? I think all the perverted uncles in India are like, ooh, and they're just perving on me. (laughs) And I think next month when I go to India, they're all going to be there perving on me in person. (laughs) Well, you know, okay, this is a, you know— you're the psychology major, so yeah. you, you tell me. But it seems interesting that, you know, I'm following, you know, you know better than, than we do, but I read the news <laughs> and I see some of the things that are happening in India mm-hmm. and there's still just rampant oppression of women. And right. um, to think that maybe the dudes who are upholding that culture are privately reveling in a girl who is totally rebelling against everything <laughs> they stand for. How does that it, make you, you feel? You know what? That's a lot of deep thought. I think that anyone that um, does those acts of stupidity that you mentioned isn't that deep to think that far, to be honest. Um, I think it's important to mention that just on that note that you touched on is that India does get a lot of that kind of media that's like, oh, look, we're so behind in the times. But 
almost every country is like that. And mm-hmm. I feel like before all my fans are like, oh, she's just hating on India. That's an important thing to remember is that. Okay, you're saying see, it's not representative. Yeah, it's of- not representative of India. Of course, we see so many stories like that, but it happens in every country, uh, unfortunately. Um, I feel like there are a lot of issues in India. That is definitely one of them. I feel like I get most of my love and hate from India. I'll just say that. Hmm. Most of my love and hate is from India. I get a lot of that sexist stuff that's like, if you ever came to India, like, we would disown you. You're just an absolute disgrace, embarrassment to Punjabi people. But then I get, like, a whole bunch of fangirls that are like, yes, come to India. I'm going to freaking wear my hat backwards just like you. Right. So it's a mix. And you, so, I mean, you're going back. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, do you have plans to meet up with fans? 100%. Or? It's actually a YouTube fan fest I'm going for. So it's a whole orchestrated meet and greet performance type thing. And I'm actually really curious to see how... My fans in India differ because I've been to Australia, New Zealand, all over North America, and I'm just so curious to see what their feedback would be because they're probably going to be the biggest critics, to be to be honest, and the biggest lovers at the same time. So I've never gone to any country and experienced in-person hate before, and I don't know if I will in India, but I kind of almost want to see what it would be like, to be honest. I want to see if there's going to be an enraged, like, uncle that's like, no, my daughter spoke and it's because of you. Like, I'm really curious. Are you going to have security with you? 100%. Did you not hear my demographic facts? (laughs) 100% I'm going to have security with me. But I feel like it's going to be interesting. I love India. I love it. I don't love everything that happens in it, but as the place to go, I love it. So, so I kind of want to go. You should go. Yeah, we can just, be your bodyguards. Just, just um, prep your bum hole. <laughs> <laughs> wow, oh, because for of the, the diarrhea, food. yeah, the food, uh, yeah, <laughs> not anything else. Yeah, not, not what you were thinking. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I at least look intimidating. Now, neither one of us could well, actually hey. do could, could actually do any harm to anybody. Mm-hmm. But I can, I can throw in my brow. I can intimidate. <laughs> I'm going to have to side with um, with uh, the tall man over here because he looks like he could step yeah. on you and me both at the same time. <laughs> even when I furrow my brow? Yeah, even even when you do the epic rap battle of manliness, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was me and my most manliness. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's all that, I got. You, you yeah. peaked at that point. Puberty went through him. Didn't you hear him? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was me. Was that you? Really? I can't remember who raps what. Oh, oh God. <laughs> uh, uh, so... Your fan base has, I mean, it, it has certainly shifted, I would, I would think, or at, at least it's, you know, you've got, you've got this community that is the, the core of your fan base, mm-hmm. but you, I mean, you're, you're, you're observing that you're reaching out more, right? Yep. Um, I feel like that has happened more in the last year where I go to meet and greets and I see white people and I'm like, oh, my God, freaking amazing. And I'm not going to lie, that feels pretty good. Not that I don't, I'm not down with my brown homies, but it feels good to know like, oh, my content is actually spreading to more people. And I've noticed that more and more and more, that more multiculturalism is happening at meet and greets and performances. And it's awesome. And I think that's because when I first started making videos, it was very Indian mom, brown mom, brown this, brown that. Mm -hmm. I have some of those videos sometimes. But now it's like girls on their period, not brown girls on their periods, right? right? I've just made my content more global because I want it to be received globally. I don't want to make content just for a specific group of people. Well, and I think it's consistent. I mean, even with some of the what you're standing for and some of the things that you're doing are to tear down some of those barriers. Mm-hmm. So, it, so it makes sense that okay, guys, I know we kind of built this thing together, right. but this is for everybody. I mean, one of the things that you say is this peace and strength without fear, without hate, one mm-hmm. love. Uh, how does that manifest itself in your in your videos? That is honestly something that I <clears throat> came to believe through YouTube. I honestly think my YouTube journey has made me the person I am spiritually. So the tattoos I have, I say without fear, without hate, because of my YouTube journey. Um, the one love thing, because of my YouTube journey. I just, when you read all the comments and you see the world come together on a website and on a web page, you're like, holy crap, there's so many people in the world and they believe so many things and there's so many things going on. Um, I just want to bring people together, show them that we're different but the same, like I mentioned earlier. So, um, well, I mean, can you give us a couple of points of how that happened? I mean, I know that I read that something about the fact that you were having a bout with depression right. when you started your YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. So even if you could tell us about that and then sure, sure. where you were spiritually at that point as well, what was the depression? So and then- when, when I went through depression, it was actually before I started making YouTube videos. Um, just... 
depression of, you know, I fell out with a few friends. I, in school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I hated my last two years of university, absolutely. Not because I wasn't good at school. I just hated school. I didn't want to be there. Um, so I had a lot of trust is- issues growing up, a lot of trust issues with friends. Fell into depression for like a year. Had a really hard time getting out of it. And So I it was a gradual thing, a lot of factors. It wasn't yeah. like one catastrophic no, event? No, 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 no. Not one catastrophic event. Just life weighing down on you in general. And I remember being on vacation with my family in Dominican Republic and just sitting literally on the beach alone. And I was like, you know what? I think I had like one or two videos out. And I was like, I feel like I want to do this YouTube thing full time. And one of my really big deciding factors was, I don't know what it was. I can't even remember. But I remember one morning I woke up in the middle of or in, towards the end of my depression. I woke up and I just felt good. I don't know what it was. Like, it was random. I hadn't felt good or happy in so long. And one morning I woke up and I was like, I feel better today. And I don't know why something switched in my brain. It might have been like a movie I watched or something that happened. And so one of my deciding factors was, holy crap, what if one of my videos could be that thing that switches something in someone else's brain? And because of one of my videos, they're like, I feel better today for some random reason. So that was a really big deciding factor. And that's why all my videos have that underlying happiness motivation because... I want to be that switch for people. And I am that switch for a lot of people, which makes it awesome because I do get a lot of emails that are like, your videos have changed my view on this or that. So the depression played a huge role in the direction of my videos. Um, In terms of the how I became the spiritual, more one love, I actually, and you you guys are lucky because I've never talked about the sly, sly (laughs) ones you are. Um, I made a video where I talked about alcohol and I had my character religiously dressed up. So he was wearing a turban and there was he was drinking. And there was a huge backlash from the Sikh community that were like, you cannot portray Sikh people like this. Um, I still to this day disagree with that because I believe there's many people who wear turbans that drink. Mm-hmm. And they should also be represented whether or not you agree with that. There's still people and they exist. Whether or not you want to pretend they don't is your choice, but they definitely do. Um And so I saw nothing wrong with that. I was told to take it down. I didn't take it down. You were told by your commenters. I was told by an organization, actually, based within Toronto, um, a sick organization, who I'm actually friends with a lot of them, so it's nothing personal. Um, Wow. And by commenters as well, who were like, no, you should take this down. And one of the greatest lessons I learned is that— Well, uh, let me ask, were you making a a point of that it was hypocritical? (laughs) Not at all. It had nothing to do with religion, the video. It was simply the fact that that character was wearing a turban and was shown drinking. So, like, religion wasn't mentioned at all. It was implied by his headdress. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I discovered then, and I regret it so much. I made this whole video after explaining my point of view on it, and I regret that so much today because when I look back at that video, I realized that out of the 10,000 comments, it's maybe 10 that were like, oh, yeah. you shouldn't do this. But those are the 10 that stuck out to me at the time. That's the way it works, um, right? <laughs> it works. That's the way it works when you're starting out. So I mean, this whole video, I also deleted that video explaining my situation because I learned through this process that I don't actually have to explain it because I believe in that's good enough. Um, but that really opened my eyes to that I'm actually not a religious person. I'm a spiritual person. And I think that's what I was really confused about growing up is that I don't believe in religious rituals. I don't believe in following rules i believe in spirituality i just believe in being a good person i believe in one god i believe in just honesty and those general values and those are the ones i will portray in my videos not any religious ones so i think the greatest thing that ever happened to me through youtube is learning that i'm spiritual not religious because it's transformed me into this just overall happy put together person now still being in uh, toronto <laughs> and still being probably around some of those people mm-hmm. that you got to know mm-hmm through your, your religion, how have they responded to this transformation and what would you hear them saying after, to, to you after you just said that? Well, that whole group of people, I'm, like I said, I'm friends with a lot of them. I see them at a lot of events and I sometimes a bit too much of a unicorn where I'm like, if you believe whatever you want to believe in, I support you because I support people who believe in something, like just stand for something, whatever you stand for, more power to you man just believe in something so I see them all the time a few of them probably definitely hate me Um, and that opened my eyes even further because I think some of the biggest people who have given me a hard time because of religion are the people who tweet about telling me I should kill myself so Mm. that just kind of shows how valid your opinion is when you're telling me that you're a disgrace to our religion because you support this you should go kill yourself and you should not be 
So what does that really say about you and your religious beliefs, especially when I look at your activities and you're way worse than you ever preached to be? So I've just learned that I just feel like a lot of religion has hypocrisy based in it. So, Right. Yeah. I find it also inspiring that, you know, coming out of a place of depression through YouTube, mm -hmm. I mean, one would think that opening up yourself to the scrutiny of anyone's comments it's just fertile ground to begin depression. Right. But you seem to have found uh, strength in the in the midst of opening yourself up to this scrutiny. Mm -hmm. it, it's weird how that works because anyone who's starting YouTube knows when you first see those comments, they burn. Those first 10 videos, those comments burn. Um, and I don't know what it is. Like, you know, since younger, I've always had that strong will when I want to do something, I will do it no matter what. And sometimes really super annoying because I'm always stressed about stupid crap I don't need to be stressed about. But a lot of those comments did bother me. But I feel like right from the get-go, I've been so blessed that a lot of my stuff has been received surprisingly positively. There's a lot of people who have come up to me and said, when you go to meet and greets, like, don't you ever have people that say nasty things to you? And I'm like, never. I've never, ever in my whole career had someone come up to me in person and say anything terrible to me which is a huge blessing because I know that that's the opposite for a lot of YouTubers. So. so do you see yourself as a comedian or do you see yourself as a spokesman? I hate saying the word comedian. One, because I really don't think I'm funny and I swear that's the truth. Two is because I don't like categorizing myself into comedian. I always say entertainer. But then I always say um, platform on YouTube because when I say entertainer, people think I'm a stripper. So I always have to clarify <laughs> that. <laughs> I say entertainer because I like... To do comedy, I love to act, I love to rap, I love to host, I love to just entertain in general. But do you also feel kind of the weight of people's expectations in terms of, I mean, the people that you're inspiring being a spokesperson mm -hmm. in that capacity of, um, I don't know, either, either representing a community or representing a certain type of person that you want to inspire. Right. I got over that whole situation and debate when I decided I'm not going to be religious anymore. And I've applied what I've learned from that to everything else. I have this rule and I had to literally sit down and talk to myself to discover this rule. It was don't ever go out of your way to try to seem like a role model. Be yourself. And if people want you to be their role model, that's their choice. A good example of this is I will never lie and be like, oh, no, I don't drink at all because I know it's frowned upon. With among South Asian females, a lot of people say, oh, South Asian females shouldn't drink, even though their fathers are usually always drunk. But um, it's frowned upon. But I will never lie and be like, no, I don't, and you shouldn't, and it's bad. No, because I do drink from time to time. But am I going to post an Instagram video of me being drunk? No. That's the rule I have where it's like, because I wouldn't do that anyways. I'm not going to promote it. I'm not going to lie about it. So what do you think is... Um because there are people who, who would post a picture of themselves right. being drunk. So cool. is that... Where is that coming from? Where do you think that, that internal standard is coming from? I think from? that's coming from me just wanting to be myself and me not wanting to do anything I do for anyone else. Because that's one of the reasons I got depressed, not living for myself. I want to do everything I do for myself and having me in the center. And if I want to do something and I believe in it, I'm going to do it. And a key example is that whole religious thing that happened. I could have taken that video down, could have... Could have totally caved, but I didn't. Because I'm like, I believe in this, and that's what I'm going to do. What are some of the, you know, because you, you've got such a uh, an interesting story, and there is so much, um, you know, all the stuff that we've been talking about. All the emotions. <laughs> it, it, what kind of opportunities has that led to outside of YouTube? Oh I, it seems God. like you would just be getting contacted by all awesome kinds of people who want Awesome opportunities. Like, it's unbelievable. Um I never thought I would do stand-up until I got an email saying, hey, do you want to do stand-up? And it's the most intimidating thing you've ever done. But I've done stand-up. I did a movie last year, which I did my first small role in a feature film. I got to meet Kunal Nair, who is Raj on Big Bang Theory, who I've become friends with. And I'm like, what? How does this make any sense? Like, I watch you on TV. Um, so I got to do that. I got to be a rap feature on an Indian artist's track who I listened to growing up, who I was a huge fan of. And again, I was like... How did this happen? I've met so many cool people. I got an ice cream date with MIA because she, really? she DM'd me. I was like, what is going on in my life? Paris Jackson, Michael Jackson's daughter, and I talk because she's a fan of my videos. Like, what is my wow. life? Like, what is my life? Like, I don't understand. So many opportunities. What kind of ice cream did you get with yeah, MIA? Yeah, you know, I bought her son macaroons and I got chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream. And she's just the most awesome person to ever... I think the greatest thing YouTube has ever done is two things. 
take me to awesome places like New Zealand, Australia. These places I would never, ever go if it wasn't for this journey and meeting awesome people. I and think Michael m- Jackson's daughter. Yeah. I've not met, but we've had a thorough conversation on, on Twitter. So Wow. Yeah. Well, one, 140 characters at a time. 140 characters, but multiple times. Multiple <laughs> 140. I think she even threw an emoticon smiley face in there one time, too. So, well, what um, about, because, you know, definitely like those sort of celebrity perk type mm-hmm, things. Right. But what about people expecting you to, oh, I want you to show up and speak about this mm-hmm. issue at this place. Like right. some of those weightier responsibilities that mm-hmm. once you kind of establish yourself as a voice, you know, when you when you have your background, it just seems like people would be like, "Oh, we need to get her to come in mm-hmm. and speak here or do or do this." One hundred percent. I feel uh, the first thing people will look at when you are a YouTuber of this nature is not what you do so much; it's how many people you do it towards. So a lot of people message me like, "Hey, so blatantly, my music's not doing so well. You have two million subscribers. Let's do a collab track." And I'm just like delete um because (laughs) look at my content first and foremost but having said that i do get a lot of emails that are like speak at this convention speak about depression speak about sickism speak about people getting killed in this part of the world and again my same rule is if i believe in it i will do it i am not a spokesperson though i'm an entertainer if i speak about certain issues while entertaining that's fine but i do not want to be a spokesperson because my job is to make people laugh and smile Mm -hmm. and i feel in my in my own way that is my social service being that switch for people who are upset, who are sad. Because I think a lot of people, times people forget when they email me, but in this country, people are starving. In this country, people are dying. I totally get that. And in my personal life, you know, I sponsor a child. I don't as much as I can. Not things I need to constantly advertise. But as an entertainer, I feel wrong picking certain issues and ignoring other ones. So my view is to, I'm going to promote one love healthy living, loving yourself, because those are just as important as all the other issues. And maybe that's because I have a personal connection with that, which is probably true. If you're a YouTuber who grew up in poverty, you're going to make YouTube videos probably that address poverty. When you're a YouTuber mm-hmm. that grew up dealing with racism, you're probably going to address that a bit more. Right. Having said that, all those people that gave me backlash because of my religious video are probably people that grew up battling those religious issues. Me, I battle depression, so my videos are about happiness and love. And I think that's fair. Hmm. And as an entertainer, where are you going to take this? Um, anywhere and everywhere, preferably not homelessness on the unemployment line. Um, honestly, I'd love to act. I really, really enjoy being on set, and I'd love to rap more. Not because I'm super good at it, but because it makes me feel the best out of everything I do. Right, because you're yeah. saying right right now, you 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 specifically said YouTube is not my career. Entertainment is my career. Right. YouTube is a platform right. uh, for that. So. Mm-hmm. Are you like, okay, well, if I could suddenly be a movie star, I'm I'm out of here? No, because, you know, and this is heavily inspired by Harley. I'll never forget when he so, told me this. He's like, I think people who get bigger deals and then stop making YouTube videos are stupid because you have a huge fan base there. That's where you started, and you should try to remain connected with that. And that really resonated with me. Of course, my whole life, I might not be able to make two videos a week, but I really hold a strong value to never just be like not making YouTube anymore anymore because I'm a movie star. I want to be hopefully a movie star that's like, hey guys, I'm making a video this month. Check me out on YouTube. I would not want to neglect those fans who got me to the place I'm at. Right. Yeah. Do you have a sense of growing pressure with such a um, accelerating fan base and the numbers getting to where they mm-hmm. are and the millions and millions? Is right. there is there a pressure? In what to sense? To keep delivering. Oh, yeah, 100%. I feel like if I don't release a video on Monday and Thursday, people will be outside my house ready to kill me. <laughs> um, there's definitely a pressure. Um, I feel like it's almost scary. And I was talking to this, I don't remember who, maybe Davey. I was talking to him saying, I feel scared that I might get to a point where it doesn't matter what I release, people will like it. And a lot of people might get confused by that saying, isn't that awesome? You can put out anything and it'll get like a million views. Like, no, because I don't want my art form to get to that point. I want to make sure I have to feel like, no, I need to impress with this video and do awesome with this video. And so I feel like I put that pressure on myself where it's like I can make it in just another brown parents video and it will probably hit a million views. But I don't want to make just another brown parents video that's going to hit a million views. So the challenge is figuring out how to expand yeah. yourself exactly. for yourself. Exactly. Hundred percent. What do you have an answer? I mean, what's the- it's constantly just trying new things, experimenting. Um, what I'm doing in LA actually is collaborating. Something I've not done at all, really, in my career thus far, except for with a few people. 
I'm not really in my element when I collaborate. So I literally thrust myself into an uncomfortable situation, collaborated with a whole bunch of people who I secretly fangirled meeting. So that was difficult as well. And that's just one way where I'm like, I'm going to up my content and collaborate with people that people would never think I would do it with. And I, I get the impression based on when you were having communications with Stevie about coming in here, mm -hmm. That you're up at all hours of the night. All hours <laughs> of the night. I gotta say, 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. <laughs> yes. It, what are you doing texting you know what? somebody at, at 3 a.m.? <laughs> you're crazy. Always. You know what it is? Is I have this theory that if you don't hit, if you don't lie down at night and you're not absolutely exhausted, then you're not doing something right. So I need to be absolutely exhausted when I go to sleep. I have a really big issue with being lazy. I feel really guilty doing it. I feel really guilty so being you're not, lazy. So you're not, you're working, you're not yeah, like Yeah, I'm working. Partying. And even when I'm, oh God. God, no, I don't. I, first of all, partying is tiring. Like, I, I, I get tired partying. I think I was telling my friend the other day, it was like 10 o'clock at my house and people were over and I was like, oh my God, I want to like just lie down because I get tired partying. I like to work. I so like at 3 to. So when, when you sent Stevie the text yeah, and if I'm you working, were still up at 3 I will get tired from working. I will get tired from partying. Yes. Well, I, I would just, say that, you know, I appreciate the sentiment. I I'll, I'll always want to go to bed extremely tired. Yes. As I, I'm not your doctor, yeah. <laughs> but I will just say uh, on behalf of the medical community, mm -hmm. you should get eight hours of sleep. Having said that, though, you'll never receive a text from me at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. Because you'll be asleep. I'll be asleeping. <laughs> okay. So only so, 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. You yes. just shifted I just a little shift. Bit. I just do a lot of, you know, the excuse creatives use that like, no, I'm just more creative at night. And I do. It's just because we're effed up and we do stuff at night. So you're nocturnal. Yeah. So I just have a little bit of a shifted clock. Okay, I yeah, get it. So well, when you all told me to come in here at 11, I was like, damn, effing retin late, Okay, man. <laughs> I get it. Well, yeah, I remember listening to, uh, I think it was the Black Sheep uh, growing up rap group. and he You're was, making this reference right now? He was, he was <laughs> bragging about going to sleep in the early morning and waking up at noon. And right. I was like, so that's the schedule of a rapper. Yeah, I yeah. want to be a rapper. That's the schedule I do, of the you know, great right there. It, <laughs> um, uh, how about this? You know, single, you're single, right? Single, attractive I'm whatever, girl I'm a, on I'm YouTube. I'm whatever you want me to be. So, I mean, <laughs> how, how has this affected your love life? Um, thanks for saying I have a love life. That's really sweet of you. Um, honestly, my love life is interesting in the sense that it is literally whatever people want it to be. I could right now, right here, be like, I have a boyfriend. This is his name. And then I can post an Instagram picture with you, and you will then be my boyfriend. <laughs> okay, like, I posted pictures with my cousins with a caption saying, my cousin, and then people have been like, oh, it's her boyfriend. So I feel like when you're in the public eye, what you say doesn't matter. Like, does what Rihanna and Chris Brown say matter at all to what we think? Not at all. We'll think whatever the hell we want to think, and we'll run with it. So, But we really want to know. <laughs> you really want to know? I will say that it has affected my love life in the sense that people see this strong, intimidating female, and guys are scared of me. I'll say that. Wow. Yeah, guys are scared of me. Like literally running from you? Um, I think guys, especially, and this is me calling out all brown guys, are a little bit intimidated by a South Asian female who's outspoken and who's also, sometimes my confidence, I'm a very confident person, sometimes too confident, and I think that deters a lot of guys away from me. Do you think, uh, if you had to make a prediction, would you think you, you'll end up with a brown guy? <clears throat> I think I will end up with a guy. I really don't care if he's brown, to be honest. That doesn't bother me at all. Um, I feel like if I did end up with a brown guy, I would like it because we probably have more in common than someone else, and especially then my mom wouldn't go through depression. But um, <laughs> but I feel like he would really have to be a brown guy that gets out of that idea that South Asian females should be quiet. Like, I would never... If he's, like, cultured like that, then hell no, that's not happening. Right. Yeah. So there's no candidates right now. Well, I don't know. You two are pretty good looking. Like <laughs> I always do this. I always do this. Well, we're we're taken. Yeah, there's, we're, there's we're no, married. There's no. There's there's people that I've constantly coupled. And I up just realized with. I said that in a totally defeated way. You're uh, married. We're, we're married. married. You're married. <laughs> you're married. Happily no. married. Good. Link. Good. I'll stop hitting on you then. Sorry, wives, Mister and Mrs. Red and Link. I said Mister by the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> I made one of you gay out of. Oh, this is just involuntary. Mister and Mrs. Mister and Mrs. Red and Link. <laughs> well, it's in that. It's, you put it in the right order. I'll tell you that much. Here's a question for you. Let's let's reverse this for a second. If you had to pair me up with someone, would how, what would you describe the guy as? Mm. Let's put you on the spot for a second. Wow, this is uh, what 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 are the characteristics? I, I, okay, if I was playing match, uh, white bodybuilder, white perfect. If, I love it. If I was playing matchmaker for you, mm -hmm. 
uh, which I don't play matchmaker with anybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, so this is this is not a good <laughs> idea. <Charted territory. laughs> Let's just start by saying this is not a good idea. <laughs> that was a black sheep lyric one time. Right, right. <laughs> I, I would say that. Well, my prediction would be that you would end up with uh, someone who ha- comes from a similar background but has experienced the same revolution in their life. Wow, I like that because it just seems. And like what is that revolution? Well, you've 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 stated it pretty well. Okay, good. So I like you know Parallel that's the path. best answer I've ever received to this question. Best. But, Maybe we should but, start a but, start a dating but that's company. Not it. That's but the but then uh, he is half. Let's make him half something. <laughs> half like half. <laughs> oh golly. Indian half. Spartan. I mean, <laughs> I'm down with that. Well, we're not Spartan. going. <laughs> we can't breed him. I mean, if that that's we can't true. create oh, well, him, then screw this. Because then he would be a baby now. So we're not, I mean, and, and that would be highly ethic, ethically questionable if we started a dating that's company not what I meant. and it involved I'm okay cloning with that. or breeding people. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I mean, if you could get two different ethnicities in one, that's pretty, that's a, that's a well, score. who's really one ethnicity? Like, you I know. can really tell you, ethnic, I don't care about it at all. Like, at all. I know my parents hate that, but I don't care about it at all. I don't care what ethnicity the guy is. I don't care. Well, we're not of much help at this point. Yeah. I think I but may be I really digging liked myself your, a hole. I really <laughs> liked your answer of experience the same revolution. I think that's very important. What about my answer? <laughs> kind of shallow and... Yeah, yeah. What? Oh, well, yeah, okay. that was good too. <laughs> and, and, but you do anticipate uh, some difficulties with your parents. And you also, you specifically call out your mom again when you think mom about that. Mom and dad, that. no. I just say mom more because like, she's my homie. <laughs> okay. Not that my dad's not my homie. And how, but, like, how do you think that's going to go over? I think my parents have come to a point in life now, especially because of my career choice and just everything I've done is so unconventional where they've kind of given up, but not in a totally terrible way. Where if I come home, they're going to know, we're going to tell Lily not to do this. She's probably still going to do it. So let's just start bringing accepting it right off the bat. That's what it's going to be, literally. They know that. Because they did everything to stop me from dancing. I still ended up dancing. Mm -hmm. They did everything to convince me not to YouTube. I'm a YouTuber. I think they've accepted that Lily is that daughter that's going to do what she wants to do. Right. Which sucks because my sister's the opposite of that. But I've already accepted that she's the star child, so it's fine. Well, you've buttered them up a little bit. A little with, bit. With all the choices that you've made. Yeah. Bringing home, you know, a half and half guy yeah. <laughs> so, at some point. You know what? I feel like the greatest thing about this is that I've proven to my parents that I made the right choice. Because they're so proud of the YouTube thing now. Right. And I think now they'll kind of trust my judgment. So I could bring home a half Spartan and it'll be fine. <laughs> Spartan. Seeking yeah. half Spartan. Put yes, that on Craigslist. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure getting to know you of and course, hear your story. thank you so much. It's time for you to sign the table. Oh yeah. my God, I'm signing the freaking table. And that's our conversation with Superwoman. The conversation has landed, but Superwoman has flown away. She's no longer here. Uh, I, I learned a couple of things. Uh, I learned the connect. Connect. <laughs> you learned? I learned the connect. Wow. And I what? was about to tell you something about pronunciation, and uh. I came up with a word <laughs> called connect. Okay. I learned the correct pronunciation of sickism. And the incorrect pronunciation of correct. Connect. <laughs> okay. Uh, mm. But I also learned that uh, I should potentially start a matchmaking service. Just because my advice uh, sucked doesn't mean your advice is great. I mean, she was impressed, but basically all you did was you said in a very eloquent way, you're you're going to you're going to end up with someone who's had the same journey as you. It was it I was mean, it was profound though. In, it, in her eyes. It sounded profound. Uh, I mean, did you see the look on her face when I delivered that I felt like I'd feel my calling. You know, it's like, I need to be, well, maybe I should be a fortune teller because I really just told her her future is really what I did. I did not match make her, make her a match. You know, I could I wear a turban. In, I don't believe in fortune telling. I can't. Well, of course, but it's all a, it's all a scam anyway to make money. You know, if this doesn't work out. Well, I can't support you in that. If you want to start a dating site like com or whatever you want to call it, I don't know, Rhett Helps You Mingle. That's not bad. More power to you, emphasis on you with no emphasis on the us. But you're saying you, I don't want you to be a fortune teller with me. That would be weird to walk into like a fortune telling duo. You know, you, you definitely immediately seem outnumbered. You, you feel like you're the victim of something. Oh, no. 
No, I'll do the fortune telling thing with you, but you'll have an earpiece and I'll be in the other room Googling whoever oh, you're talking to and yeah. like feeding you miraculous information that's about good. them. That's good. I like that. And say, just rephrase something about their own life in terms of that's who they're going to want to be with in the future and that'll impress them. If we're going to do this, we probably shouldn't let people hear this this plan. Because oh, we we're can't, not, can't take advantage of anybody. Oh, you're still listening out there in your biscuit land? Oh, Okay. Thank you for doing that. I didn't know you would hang on this long. Uh, but we will be here uh, next week to give you another one of these where you can learn how to n- pronounce or not pronounce things or whatever. You know, uh, we value the time that you have spent with us. And in the meantime, this week, you will have good experiences. Uh, <laughs> you'll have bad experiences. Uh, you'll probably eat something. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, sleep. You, they'll they'll also sleep. You'll sleep a little bit, but you should sleep more. That's oh, that, healthy. That was your that was your fortune. I was predicting your future for the week. 